Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the first Briz Science of 2018. This is the University of Queensland's Briz Science Lecture Series, a series of free public lectures on science where we bring not just the best scientists, but also great communicators to share their work and other cutting edge advancements of science with Brisbane. Um, we're really excited to be back again this year. Uh, this is just one of the public events that the University of Queensland puts on. Um, they do other events, not just in science, but across all the different areas. So if you want to find out more about that, head to the UQ Events website, or of course you can hop online and sign up to the Briz Science Facebook page or email list and all the other ways of, we communicate to make sure you don't miss any of the fantastic lectures that we have on this year. Uh, I'm, of course, your host for the evening, Joel Gilmore, and we are hosted this year once again at The Edge, part of the State Library of Queensland, and we're really happy to be back. Thank you for having us. Um, and again, they have lots of other wonderful events on here too. You might have seen some people heading downstairs tonight for one of the many makerspace workshops, so check those out online as well. And I would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting tonight and to pay my respect to elders both past and present. Tonight, a couple of bits of housekeeping. We're going to have um, our speaker first, which I'll introduce in a moment. Then we will have some questions at the end. And we take questions in two ways. One is via Twitter. So you can use the hashtag BrizScience or follow the handle UQBrizScience and ask your questions on there. Or you might have picked up a question slip on the way in and you can write down your question. At the end of Caitlin's talk, we will come round and collect as many of those questions as we can and go through as many as we can before the talk is over. However, if your burning question doesn't get asked, we will have some food and drinks outside afterwards and a chance for you to ask and have some more casual chats with Caitlin there as well, as well as amongst yourselves. This should be a social evening as much as anything. And I think that's all of the key points. So tonight, we are talking about technology, and particularly genetics. And this has come a long way. The technology advanced a lot from the days of genetically modified spiders producing superheroes. Um, but with that advancement of technology, as Spider-Man says, with great power comes great responsibility. And we now have the ability to get online and order a genetic test to our door and we can find out about where we're from, maybe what diseases we have, but in exchange, we hand over our data to private companies, our genetic data. So what happens to that data? How should it be treated? And how do we track and keep that data confidential? And maybe the answer lies in other technologies like the blockchain. So to explore this more, it's my great pleasure tonight to be able to introduce Dr. Caitlin Curtis from the University of Queensland. Caitlin has a broad background in genetics and research, including forensic DNA, ancient DNA, and more recently has become fascinated by the overlap of genomics and technology and the data and privacy implications and how all of these new emerging technologies work together. So to explore those questions a little bit more deeply, could you please put your hands together and join me welcoming Dr. Caitlin Curtis. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for the introduction. It's great to be here. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk to you about the emergence of what we might call the genomics marketplace. So I'm going to touch a bit on what a genetic test is, some of the privacy issues with genetic data, and how cryptocurrencies might have some of the solutions. So last year was the biggest year ever for direct-to-consumer genetic testing. And when I say direct-to-consumer testing, I'm kind of talking about the types of tests that you see on this slide. And you're probably familiar with some of those names. Ancestry DNA, 23andMe, uh, MyHeritage. There have actually been an explosion of these tests on the market, and some of them are a lot more evidence-based than others. Most of them are ancestry-type tests where you submit your DNA and then you get a report about your origin and who you might be related to. But there are a wide variety of these things on the market. You may not be aware, for example, that you can take a genetic test to determine if you're a superhero or whether to determine the breed of your dog or your cat. What was most surprising to me, though, when I put together this slide wasn't something that was on it. It was actually what wasn't on it. 
because there were so many different types of DNA tests that I couldn't put them all onto one slide, so this isn't even comprehensive. These tests are incredibly popular, and some of you may have had one of these tests, or you may know someone that's had one of these tests. And in this market, the two largest companies by far are Ancestry DNA, who have over 7 million um, consumers in their genomic database, at, or genetic database, and 23andMe, who have about 3 million people. And um, with all the major testing companies combined, over 12 million people have now had a genetic test. And so when you look at that figure, you can see it increasing through time, and then it gets to 2017, and it kind of skyrockets. It almost triples, and it crosses over to 12 million people by 2018. And most of these consumers are in the United States, where it's estimated that one in 25 people has now had one of these direct-to-consumer genetic tests. But they're extremely popular in Australia as well. At the same time, what was happening in 2017, it was a pretty crazy year in the world of cryptocurrency. Billions of dollars were poured into Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. And I think at this point, there are over 1,300 different cryptocurrencies on the market. And we've seen crazy things like joke coins, like Dogecoin, now being taken seriously. And now we even have a Jesus coin. And you may be familiar with the story of BitConnect. But if you're not, you probably know that there have been plenty of scams in the whole cryptocurrency frenzy. So how is this all connected? Well, people have different feelings about Bitcoin, cryptocurrency. Maybe it's the future of money. Maybe it isn't. But one important thing has come from Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, and that's the technology that underpins it. That technology is called blockchain. So blockchain was invented about a decade ago, in around 2008, to serve as the public ledger for the cryptocurrency Bitcoin. And blockchain really serves as a digital ledger, and it provides accountability and transparency, and we'll touch on it a bit more later. But what's interesting is that there are several startups that are thinking about using this blockchain technology to address some of the genetic privacy issues. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So we'll start by talking about what a genetic test is, how does one of these things work. I'll walk you through a bit of um, a genetic test, like using the example of a direct-to-consumer test like 23andMe. And I'm not going to go into too much detail about DNA in this talk, but I just wanted to remind you that DNA is the code to make us, and it contains all of the information to make all the cells in our body. So, the basic premise is this. So you start by collecting a biological sample, and these days that's normally a saliva sample. So you can either collect that by spitting in a tube or maybe doing a cheek swab, and then you pack that up, pop it into an envelope, and send it to the direct-to-consumer company where they do the laboratory analysis. And then they're going to email you back a report. So the entire genetic code is called the genome, and the human genome is absolutely massive. It's three billion letters. And we know pretty much what those letters are, and we're still kind of trying to work out what they mean and how they all work together to make you and me. And we've come really far with sequencing technology. So over the past decade, we have been making machines that can read the entire human genome and turn it into digital data faster and cheaper. And the biggest company that dominates this market right now is called Illumina, and you can see some of their sequencing machines here. And to put this into some perspective, over 90% of the sequencing data in existence has been generated on a machine that was made by Illumina. So around the turn of the century, we were working hard at sequencing the first human genome. And that was a massive project that was actually called the Human Genome Project. And that took researchers from around the globe. Um, it, took, uh, it cost $3 billion, and it took 13 years to accomplish that first human genome. If you fast forward today, in 2018, we can sequence human genomes regularly. It usually takes about a week. But if you're really rushing, you can do it in a day. And a Guinness record was just set for sequencing a human genome in under a day. And that was 19.5 hours. And not only are we getting better at sequencing DNA faster, we're also making technology 
that is smaller and more portable. And so what I'm showing you here is some technology from Oxford Nanopore. And uh, the, the top device is actually a USB-powered portable sequencing device that actually kind of pulls DNA through a tiny hole to read it. And what you see on the bottom is a product in development that's going to allow you to sequence DNA directly from a phone. So we have all these amazing developments in DNA sequencing, but the cost to sequence a full human genome is still kind of expensive. It's around $1,000, kind of depending on who you ask and how you do the math. And so most of those direct-to-consumer companies aren't sequencing full genomes at the moment. What they're mostly doing is looking at a fraction of the DNA, a fraction of the genome. And they're doing this using this technology. This is called a SNP chip. So a SNP chip kind of looks at a set of letters or markers, usually about 600,000-ish. And when I say SNP, that's an acronym for Single Nucleotide Polymorphism, SNP. And that's just um, a DNA letter that's different between people. So the data that comes off one of these SNP chips is called a genotype. And the direct-to-consumer companies can look at a genotype instead of looking at the entire human genome because even though our genome is massive, most of it is identical between all of us. Most of it is the same, over 99% of it, actually. But it's those bits of it that are different that are the most important, at least in this context, because they're the parts that contain the information that make us different from each other. And so to give you an idea of this to scale, here we have this figure. And on the left, you can see a representation of the whole human genome. So that's those 3 billion letters. Then in the middle, you can see the variable sites in the genome. So that's 15 million letters, roughly. And on the right, that little tiny dot, that shows the output of one of those SNP chips. It's 600,000 letters. And if you want to think about this a different way, if you decided to print out the human genome in very small font, you could fill up all the folders in these bookshelves, which is actually 100 folders. But the output of one of those SNP chips that might be used from the direct-to-consumer company is up there at the top where it says genotyping, and that would be 90 pages. So back to our process, it's that last step in the process where you get your digital genetic data, where things start to get a little bit complicated. And that's the part we're going to talk about in this next section. So most people would probably be kind of familiar with the model that you send your uh, DNA sample and some money to the direct-to-consumer company, and they analyze that. And then they send you back genetic data and a report. But some of the companies began to realize that there was additional value in the genetic data itself and in owning these large databases of genetic data. And so selling the kits only became part of a larger picture. And so you can see this quote from a board member from one of these direct-to-consumer companies. And he's basically saying that the long game isn't actually selling the kits, but once you have the data, then you can become the Google of personalized healthcare. And so what people may or may not be aware of is that sometimes these companies are on selling the genetic data to pharmaceutical companies for research. And so as far back as 2015, there were several of these multi-million dollar sales of genetic data uh, to various pharmaceutical companies. And this sort of illustrates a larger issue in the direct-to-consumer genetic marketplace, which is, do we know what's happening with our genetic data once we take one of these tests? How is it stored? Who has access to it? And is there enough transparency that consumers are able to understand what's happening with their genetic data? To put this into some context, one of the people who's asking these kinds of questions is shown here. So this is United States Senator Chuck Schumer. And at the end of last year, he called for an investigation into the privacy policies of some of these companies with this very memorable quote. There is no point in learning about your family tree if your privacy gets chopped down at the same time. So <clears throat> it turns out there are several privacy issues with our highly sensitive genetic data. And so why is genetic data important? Why is genetic privacy important? Because our genomes contain all of the information to make us. So they contain highly sensitive information that we might want to keep private. 
And we thought about this and wrote an article about this for the conversation, and that's my co-author James, who's back there. And <laughs> so if you're interested in reading more about this, please feel free to check it out. Um, the, the main reason that we might want genetic privacy is because we don't want genetic discrimination to happen. And so because our genomes contain all the information to make us, they also contain sensitive information. They contain our disease risk profile and whether or not we carry pathogenic genetic variants. And this can be used as the basis for genetic discrimination. Some countries have addressed this by making laws to prohibit insurance companies from discriminating on the basis of genetic data. As you can see from the title of this article, which I would encourage you to check out if you're interested, Australia has perhaps a bit ways to go in this domain. So in Australia, you cannot, this doesn't apply to health insurance, but if you take a genetic test in Australia and then your life insurance policy or provider, I mean, asks you about that, you're required to disclose that information. Another thing we might want to be thinking about is what kind of access do we want to give law enforcement to this kind of information? Because at the moment, forensic databases are highly regulated, and who can be included in a forensic database is highly regulated. And there are some examples in the United States of people becoming a suspect in a crime because they have a relative who's taken a genetic test and then made that data publicly available in a publicly searchable ancestry database. And so what we don't want, I think, is to become a suspect in a crime because we've taken a genetic test or because we have a relative that's taken a genetic test. And the relatives kind of enter in this picture because we share a lot of genetic information with our relatives, especially our close relatives. So we share 50% of our DNA with each of our parents and we pass on 50% of our DNA to each of our children. And so what that means is that the decisions that we make about who to share our genetic information with kind of affect not only us, but also our close relatives and subsequent generations. So the laws of inheritance kind of dictate that we inherit 50% of our genetic information from our parents and we pass that on to our children, but do we even own our DNA? So Barack Obama talked about this at a White House summit in 2016, and he said what I think kind of a lot of us would like to think about this, which is that we would like to think that we own our own DNA, and we would like to think that we own the digital representation of our DNA, but actually in Australia as well as in the United States, that's not necessarily the ca case, and it's not entirely clear or resolved. But we're moving now from the research phase in genomics into the, the, the medical and the clinical phase, and we already have some genetic tests for medical conditions, and probably the most well-known of these is up here, the BRCA gene test from Myriad. And um, <clears throat> so people that have one of these gene variants, it can be very devastating because then you can have an up to 87% chance of going on to develop breast cancer. And this is a clinically actionable test, and people that find out their carriers might go on to have a medical procedure. And I think that we all became very aware of that through the very public experience of Angelina Jolie, which was, <coughs> which was, was quite broadly known. And so in this case, there's a the direct connection between a gene mutation and a disease trait. But what we've learned over the past 10 years is that this is probably the exception and not the rule. And so for most diseases, it's not so clear cut. Most diseases are caused by many genes. They're what we call polygenic. And so we need large databases in order to make these sorts of complex connections. So what we need really are large-scale genomic studies with high-quality genomes and high-quality medical data attached. And we already have some of these projects going in the world, very large-scale genomic studies, and many more are planned, but there's a problem with, with that in that the data is kind of siloed in all of these groups because researchers can't really easily share genetic data with each other even because of the privacy issues that I've already been talking about. 
So what we need is a way for individuals to share genetic data and researchers to share genetic data in a way that still protects the privacy needs of individuals. And so that's where blockchain may come into the equation. So <clears throat> there, as I said, there are some companies thinking about blockchain and how that might be used to create a safe way for people to store genetic information and share genetic information so that research can advance um, and so that this genetic information can be used in studies and help with this genomic revolution. And so we kind of heard about that, that there were these startups out there that were thinking about this and creating a DNA marketplace, which is a pretty new thing. So we wanted to learn about this, and we wrote about it in the conversation. And before I get into that, I'll just touch a bit on what blockchain actually is. So you may have heard of blockchain, and usually what you hear with blockchain is that it's a digital ledger. And kind of really all that means is that it's good at recording transactions. And so there's an example, a dodgy example of a spreadsheet that I put up there, but just to illustrate that this is a good way to record transactions in much the way that we're familiar with, and that these transactions can then be, uh, can be um, stored into a block, and then this block is kind of distributed among many, many computers. So it's kind of different from what we have in the sense that we're used to having a central database, a centrally curated database, and there's a certain amount of trust that that will be curated appropriately, whereas a blockchain ledger is distributed over many, 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 many computers. And the other thing is that each time there's a transaction, it's, it's, it's uploaded instantaneously, and it's recorded in such a way that it's pretty much impossible to change it. So that means that this provides transparency and accountability and trust. And so with a public blockchain, like a, the Bitcoin blockchain, anybody can go online and see it. And I grabbed a screenshot from Block Explorer, and what you, can, you can see the latest blocks and the latest transactions. And so what's become apparent is that blockchain is useful beyond cryptocurrency and beyond Bitcoin. And there are many governments around the world that are thinking about how they can use this technology. And Dubai, for example, is, is hoping to become the world's first blockchain nation or blockchain government and um, put many of their governmental services onto blockchain-based platforms. So we heard about this new space and we wanted to learn what a, a DNA marketplace might look like once it went online, but it wasn't online yet. So we contacted three of the startups that we heard of, and they are listed here in CryptGen, Xenome, and Luna DNA. And you can see their specific currencies, cryptocurrencies listed on the right. And I want to step back and say that this is in no way a recommendation or an endorsement, and that I don't have any stake in any of these companies. But this was a good way for us to learn about what this DNA marketplace might look like. So all these companies, they're in early development, and they, they, they aren't up online yet, so we contacted the CEOs from these companies and kind of asked them what they're planning to do. And the companies all have slightly different variations of what they're doing, but basically it's something like this, and I'll try to walk you through what I mean. So <laughs> you can take your genetic information that you get from a direct-to-consumer test, and you can actually take genetic information that you get from anywhere else, perhaps the clinic, and you can upload it into one of their blockchain-based platforms. And so hopefully you'll notice that this gray line, the gray, area, the gray arrows, your DNA data is not protected. Once you upload it into the blockchain-based platform, it's anonymized, it's encrypted, and then all the subsequent access to your genetic data is, is, is mediated through the blockchain. And so you control access to your genetic data and you, can, you know who has accessed it because you have the security key. And so through this blockchain-based platform, you can share your genetic data with research companies or uh, research groups, and then they can pay you for that access with the cryptocurrency that's created for the platform. You can also share your genetic data with your doctor, and you can use that cryptocurrency to buy genetic services on some of the platforms. So 
Of all the companies that we talked to, Encryption was the farthest along. Encryption was founded by David Kepsel, and he's a, he's a lawyer and a philosopher, and his wife, Vanessa Gonzalez, is a genetic scientist. So they had this idea and formed Encryption, and um, they've already had their ICO now, which is their initial coin offering, and February 19th, their blockchain went live. So they're really leading edge here, and now anyone can upload their genetic information into this blockchain. And so what kind of happens is, once your genetic information is up there, then if a company would like to purchase it, they'll send you a request, and then you're free to say yes or no. Encryption kind of have a different twist than everyone else because they're running a private permission-based blockchain, which is slightly different. Um, it's free to upload genetic information for up to five family members, including pets. And, <laughs> you, and uh, you're free to take your genetic data down at any time, but any access that you've already granted would continue. Then the next company that we talked to is Xenome, and they were founded by a group of young Russians, and most of them have PhDs in biological sciences and bioinformatics. And they're taking a different approach still. So you upload your genetic information onto their platform, they anonymize it, encrypt it, and then they split it up into b tiny bits, and they share it over a multitude of computers. And so, for your security, no one computer has anybody's whole genome at the same time. And then the user's own information and medical information is stored on their own computer. And so, it's similar again through this platform, then you can share access for medical reasons or you can sell access to your genetic data. And the last one, Luna DNA, is kind of the corporate player in this space. So, uh, they're a public benefit corporation, though. And they have kind of a different aim altogether. So they're trying to actually create a research database on the blockchain for big pharmaceutical companies and researchers to use. And so the thinking kind of is that the more genetic information that they have, that the more valuable this will be to research groups and pharmaceutical companies, and then the more that's going to be worth, and then in turn, the more that will be worth to the, to the donors themselves. And so when you upload into Luna DNA, it's a bit different as well. You agree to broad access to your genetic data, and then different approved groups can come in and do research projects on this genetic database. And as it turns out, after we wrote this article, like, this space is just really taking off. And um, DNA marketplaces all over. Another company started up on February 8th after we published the article, and they're called Nebula Genomics, and they've got this very prominent person in the world of sequencing, George Church, and they have a different twist again, and they're doing all their DNA sequencing directly onto the blockchain. And so we thought, hmm, this is really a good step forward, it looks like, and uh, you, this is a technology that's going to enable safe sharing and safe storage of genetic data, but are there any risks to this kind of solution? And so we kind of started thinking about security. And what these companies are kind of selling is security, and blockchains are secure, but it's important to remember that no technology is infallible, um, including blockchain technologies. So there are already known hacks and known attacks, like the 51% attack, which is also the majority attack, and there will likely be new attacks developed in the future. And we also wondered about law enforcement. Like, once there's a DNA marketplace and there are these assemblages of big genetic data, is law enforcement going to just um, want to pressure these companies into accessing this? So we put that question to the, 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 the startup companies, and Encryption and Xenome said that the way that their data is encrypted and de-identified, that even the developers can't determine who owns the genetic information. And Luna DNA said that they could determine it, but that they wouldn't grant access to outside agencies. And then we thought about pricing. And if you know anything about cryptocurrencies or following the news, what you'd probably know is that they're very volatile. And so we started thinking, how is that going to affect the price of data on these platforms? Is it going to fluctuate wildly like cryptocurrency? 
and how is that going to affect the researchers that are trying to do big projects. And so perhaps these companies are going to have to have some sort of mechanism to keep that price a bit stable. We also thought of, thought of some larger questions about building a DNA marketplace. So is, if we make a DNA marketplace, is this going to drive up the cost of research? Is this going to make it so that only large pharmaceutical companies with big pockets are able to buy access to genetic data? And is it going to price out the small companies and, and universities? Or is it going to be the opposite and maybe the cost of research is going to go down because researchers are no longer going to have to generate these kind of expensive genetic data, but they can just go to the blockchain and the DNA marketplace and just buy it? And also, are people going to still be willing to donate DNA to science if they can just go onto one of these platforms and sell access instead? So encryption and Xenome told us that they're going to have their price of genetic data determined by the open market. And Luna DNA is imagining different pricing for big corporations and then a second pricing tier for nonprofits and things like universities. Then we thought about the quality of the analysis services on these platforms because it turns out that there are many companies these days that would ask you to send in your genetic information from a direct-to-consumer company or wherever you've gotten it, and they're going to reanalyze it for you, and they're going to tell you something new about yourself. And a lot of these companies are not really based on sound science, and some of them are doing things like telling you that they can predict what a couple's baby will look like, or using their, your DNA, they can find you the perfect romantic match. And so we wondered how consumers are going to navigate this, this new ecosystem and, and figure out which of these companies are based on sound science. So the companies are handling this different ways. Encryption is planning on having partners. They'll buy in with nodes. Xenome is thinking more like a rating system. And this doesn't really apply to Luna because they're not offering third-party analysis. The quality issue kind of goes both ways, and there are quality issues that might affect the researchers themselves as well. So some of these companies are offering rewards for people to upload their genetic information and to upload medical data. And we kind of wondered if that might provide an incentive to people to upload a lot of medical data, and maybe some of that would be misleading or inaccurate. And lar and a larger question than that, like, are people really the best point of contact to upload the kind of granular, really detailed medical information that you would need to do some of these big association medical studies. We also thought about the utility of these platforms and how easy they would be to use, because I think it's safe to say that for most of us, buying cryptocurrency and selling cryptocurrency is slightly intimidating and confusing. But if these platforms are going to build databases on the order of millions, that we're going to need for these research studies to, to find these disease associations, then they're going to need to make them pretty easy to use. We also wondered if people are going to really be able to understand these access requests and really understand what they're agreeing to. Because understanding what you're agreeing to by granting access to your genetic data is slightly complex. And the implications of it are, are, are quite complex as well. And we're kind of used to living in this day and age of just scrolling through all these terms and conditions, and they're in really small font, and we just go scroll, 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 and then we hit I accept, and we might not necessarily know what we accepted. And so if these companies are going to try to deliver on this promise to, to, to put people in control of their genetic information, then they're probably going to need to present that information in a way that's very clear and understandable. And so, if you're anything like my co-author, James, you're probably thinking at this point, ooh, I can sell my DNA, and am I going to get rich from that? And that is a really hard thing to predict. Like, it's very hard to know a priori how much these companies would be willing to, to, to buy genetic data for. We have some things to think about, though. These companies, from their standpoint, and the research groups, are looking to assemble genomic databases on the order of millions. So it's likely that each data access would be a relatively small amount. But your genetic information might get used in multiple studies, so that could kind of add up over time. Also, 
as I said, your, your, your genomic data is going to be more valuable if it's coupled with high-quality medical data. And possibly, uh, the value will go up if, when there are new uses that are discovered through time. So, Xenome estimated that 23andMe earned $130 million by selling access to a million genotypes. And so, when you do the math, that works out to about $130 per genotype, and possibly that's a good starting point. So, <clears throat> I'm going to kind of switch gears for the last part of this talk, and we're going to focus on this broader question of can DNA data ever really be fully anonymous? We've been talking about anonymizing DNA and removing the names. And so there's a, there's a growing field in genomics of trying to use DNA to predict physical traits. So, and that field is called um, um, DNA phenotyping. So one of the leaders in this field in DNA phenotyping, particularly with physical, physical appearance, is named Dr. Susan Walsh, and she's at Purdue University. And in 2010, she and her group created this system um, called IrisPlex. And IrisPlex, you can, you can use a, a, a DNA sample and you can predict if somebody is going to have brown eyes or blue eyes, and you can do that with 95% accuracy. And then, in t around 2013, they added hair to the, uh, to the prediction, and so now they had a combined test, and they changed the name to H, irisplex. And you can find the test online. Um, I put the website here, and you can go and check it out for yourself and use the tool for yourself. What I think is pretty incredible about these tools is that if you look at them, they use very few SNPs or very few markers to determine these things. So for the eye test, you can see that there are just six SNPs, and for the combined test, there are 24. Last year, the group developed a model for, to predict skin color from genetic data. And this was used just a few weeks ago uh, in a very high-profile publication to, d to make an estimation of what Cheddar Man may have looked like. And this made international news, maybe some of you know about it, but if you're not familiar with Cheddar Man, Cheddar Man refers to the oldest complete skeleton that was ever found in the United Kingdom. So those bones were uncovered in Cheddar Gorge, which is in Somerset, and they were radiocarbon dated and to about 10,000 years ago. So researchers looked at some of the ancient DNA, and they applied some of these tools, including this new skin prediction tool, and they predicted with those tools that Cheddar Man was likely to have had dark skin, dark hair, and blue eyes. So as I said, this is a really hot area of research, and at the end of 2017, there was another study published using a slightly different technique to use DNA to, to predict features. So this study was published by Craig Venter and his private company, which is called Human Longevity, Inc. And so they used a whole genome approach to try to predict some physical characters. And so what they looked at were 3D facial structure, voice, biological age, height, weight, body mass index, eye color, and skin color. And so they took human genomes from a little over 1,000 people, and they looked at the full genome, and then they took those 1,000 people and they made very detailed measurements of everything, and they developed a model to, to predict these traits and predict these faces from the DNA. And in the publication, they said that they could re-identify people from their DNA data eight out of 10 times, but it's important to say what they meant by re-identify. So in this case, re-identify was pick these people out of a lineup of about 20 people, and those people were comprised of a group of ethnically mixed and gender mixed group. So right away, that study drew a lot of commentary and a fair bit of criticism. And so about a week after that study was published, um, there was a, a rebuttal published by Yaniv Ehrlich, and he's pictured here on the right. He's been dubbed by nature as the genome hacker. He's a very active in the field of genome privacy. So he published this rebuttal, and he said that um, 
the way that the, that the re-identifications were done by picking people, re-identifying people in these mixed groups was basically driven by knowing their ancestry and knowing their gender, and not so much by the faces that were, that were reproduced by the DNA or predicted by the DNA. And you can see some of those predicted faces in the predicted column that's directly from the publication. And another thing about the faces is that they were all rather generic, and they kind of represented generic racial averages. So there's another company in the United States that is looking at DNA phenotyping, and they're applying machine learning to DNA phenotyping. And so this is taken directly from their website, and this company is called Parabon, and they'll do what they call a DNA snapshot. So you can give them um, a, an unknown genetic sample and $3,600, and they will do genetic tests and SNP analysis, and they'll, then they'll predict several um, traits from the DNA. And so they'll predict skin color, eye color, hair color, freckles, face shape, and a few other things. And the way they're doing this, though, is, is, is by an algorithm that is closed source and it's proprietary and it's not based on uh, scientifically peer-reviewed publications that everybody can look at and investigate. And so people aren't able to tell how they're doing this or how well they're doing this. And so, of course, this has drawn a lot of skepticism from scientists and from every, a lot of people that are not scientists. Um, but the reality is that this company is, is operating and um, they have even been involved in a serial rape case in the Gold Coast in Queensland. So DNA phenotyping is here and it's controversial and it's not 100% clear how well it works, although we know that we can predict some traits with more confidence than others. But this is, a, this is a nascent field, and it's probably going to expand as we get these genomic databases and we put machine learning on it. So it's projected that our ability to predict physical traits using genetic data is, is likely to improve over time. So it's pretty clear when you look at identical twins how much of our face is in our DNA, and sort of the question becomes how well if at all, are we going to be able to, to progress in figuring this out? What seems very likely, though, is genomic data is never likely to be fully anonymous. And so just taking the names and the addresses off genomic data is not likely to fully prevent it from being re-identified, and particularly in the future. So I'd like to leave you with a few thoughts. Um, we're at the verge of going from research genomics into medical genomics, and this is a great thing, and it's going to bring a lot of benefit to a lot of people, and it's already starting, and that's great. And I also think that genetic privacy is important, and it's something that we should be thinking about. Um, I hope that I've highlighted that genetic data privacy is kind of a family affair and that when we make a decision about that, it could also have implications for our relatives and subsequent generations. And I think that blockchain has a lot of promise as a tool to develop platforms to help with this and help promote safe storage and sharing and certainly transparency and accountability with this kind of data. Um, but I think that I would like to leave you with a quote from David Kepsel, and he is the founder of EncryptGen that was kind of at the forefront of the, this movement. And I think what he's saying is that we should be careful not to view this technology and these technologies as a silver bullet. We really need to, to have a larger picture that's gonna include uh, discussions about education, legislation, and policy so that we can move forward into this new genomics revolution in a way that's beneficial for everybody. So that's all I have for my presentation, and thank you very much for listening, and I would be happy to answer or try to answer any questions that you have.
Thank you so much, Kate. We'll give you an opportunity to have a drink and relax for a moment before sure. the interrogation start. Now, if you've got a question, if you'd like to, we've had several come in on Twitter, if you'd like to write it down, wave it in the air, and Gurion um, is there. Yes, Leonie is there. Great. Now, we'll come around and collect those questions. Next month, I unfortunately can't announce our speaker yet. We're trying to get someone um, particularly exciting, but we just haven't confirmed them yet. So watch this space. Uh, more details will be revealed soon. In the meantime, if you're desperate for Briz Science Fix, don't forget that all of our videos are available online. You can hop on to our website and go back through the last several years of videos and catch up. And of course, tonight's video will be up in a week or two as well if you want to get all those details. All right. Um, Kate, are you ready to um, come up on stage? So, we've got a whole lot of different questions. Um, Starting with, well, we have questions about where they can DNA test their dogs to be superheroes, but let's move on from that. <laughs> Thanks for that, Nicola, off Twitter. Um, so the first question is, have you had a DNA test? I have not. Surprisingly enough, I have not. Good. <laughs> Easy. So, so um, I'll, I'll ask my own follow-up about that. You've decided that on balance, the, the, the information you get now isn't worth the trade-offs for you? I'm not sure it's that conscious of a decision. I just haven't, um, I think there are many benefits to it. I just haven't, um, I haven't done it myself. Okay. So first question from Twitter. Philip asks, what do the DTC companies do with the DNA after they send it to you? Do they delete it or do they sell it before you can upload it to the blockchain? Uh, that's an interesting question. So the DNA data, um, it will be dictated by the terms and conditions with your direct-to-consumer company. So you, so there's no unified thing that happens with the, with the DNA data at this time, which is something that I, I think is kind of an issue. Um, so you have to read the terms and conditions. Since uh, the, the end of last year when um, Chuck Schumer called for this investigation, that did raise a lot of awareness. And I've been watching sort of the, the, the terms and conditions space with the, a lot of these direct-to-consumer companies. And to be fair, some of them are responding. I've noticed a, a, quite a few changes in the terms and conditions. But the thing is that there doesn't seem to really be an, a way yet for most companies to opt out of the anonymized, aggregated data sharing. That, that You can opt out of the, the very specific data sharing, but um, you really need to read the terms and conditions, I, I, I think. So, and a, a possibly a follow-up question, Margaret asks, if I have done an ancestry DNA test, can I still sell my DNA or will someone else already have sold it? <laughs> well, um, if they send you, normally uh, the, big, the big ancestry companies allow you to download your own genetic data or, and, they'll, and they'll send that to you or you can download it because you'll get a report but you can also download your data so you would be able to then share it. Whether or not they're sharing it and selling it would sort of, again, be dictated by the terms and conditions. Right. Technical question. Um, okay. What is the file size of these genetic records? <laughs> they're, they're, they're big. They can be, um, wow. Um, I'm James? Yeah, 100 gig-ish, 100 gigabases, 90 gigabases. It's sort of... You know, I hesitate because it's sort of, um, as they get analyzed, they sort of change size. And so when you analyze them in a lot of different ways, you can actually end up with using a lot of data. Right. Um, question from Richard. How reliable are genetic tests for finding our ancestors? Well... I would say that um, the laboratory side of, of genetic testing is now relatively standardized and a lot of the companies are operating like pretty well um, accredited um, labs and so from the, the technical generating the data is quite standardized and generally likely to be pretty good. I mean, I, I don't know for sure for every company. Um, the part that gets a bit different is, is the way that they analyze the data. They, they, the algorithms that they use are proprietary but in general, they're based on established methods in the, in the scientific literature, and there's sort of iterations of that. But then there's a bit of variability in, in exactly what algorithm they use and what database 
they use to compare it with. So um, most of them start off with this um, thousand genome project data, uh, but um, they, if they have different data sets that they compare with, they might have slightly different, different answers. So I would say overall with a big brushstroke that ancestry determining or estimating, it's not really a determination, estimating ancestry is, you know, we're, we're getting quite good at it in general. Right. That was a big talk, sorry. No, that was, that was a very good answer. We've got a few different questions on a similar theme, so I'm going to vaguely summarise these. Um, so they're on the theme of, if you're selling access to your DNA, will some genetic data become more valuable than others? Rare genes. And perhaps a related question is, um, will selling your DNA data potentially skew future pharmaceuticals or research towards only certain groups who might be more likely to sell their DNA? Yeah, so those are really good questions, and those are actually questions that we thought about and we talked about, so I can, I can answer those a bit. So we brought up that, that, that question about like, are some genomes, is everybody's genome going to be worth the same amount right off the bat? And sort of the answer is, I will summarize sort of the best thing that they say is, um, yeah, we're going to, that's the idea, but obviously if there are some um, geno genomes and genotypes that are, you know, really important sort of rare things that they are kind of likely to become maybe more valuable and it's, and it's quite hard to predict. And as for the other question um, about the sort of the diversity that's going to be represented in this kind of a system, Yes, um, that is a hugely important thing in genomics because at the moment, whoever asked may be aware that like the, 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 the tests are really biased toward Europeans and so even there's a new test from Myriad that, that predicts breast cancer if you don't have the BRCA gene and that one is only available to women of European descent because the data just isn't there in those, in those um, genomic databases to, 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 to create product apparently, for any other um, groups for women. So this is hugely important, and this was one of the founding things that Luna DNA, one of the reasons they're a public benefit corporation, because they're trying to even that out somehow. And I would say that that new company, Nebula, they've sort of addressed that question as well. So they recognize that there's going to be a discrepancy in the underrepresented groups, might not actually be likely to do genome sequencing. So you can actually register you know, sort of your interest and put your name and medical information. And then if there's a pharmaceutical company or a researcher that is interested in that sort of medical data, they'll actually contact you. And if you agree, then they would pay for the sequencing or subsidize the sequencing. And that, in principle, is an attempt to sort of get at this, this diversity problem that, so that the, the, the targeted medicine and the, and the benefits from the genomics can reach a more diverse group. Um, Corinne asks, we have a lot of questions around access and who collects and who gets it. Um, Corinne asks, can a third party sell my DNA? For example, a company if they have my tissue or fluids. Ooh. Um, I wouldn't be able to answer the specifics of that, and, and I'm not a lawyer, but um, uh, I'm going to have to say I, 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 I'm not really sure. That might be sort of a case-by-case -case thing. I'm not sure on what context you'd have your, 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 your tissue or your fluids stored and what, you know, what parameters that was, d that was done. So um, it's a good question, but I, I don't really know. This is presumably pushing a lot of boundaries around existing legal frameworks and privacy and what, what counts as health or data, is that? Yeah, that's right, and it's just the situation where the technology, as I hope I showed, like the technology is escalating so quickly, and the, the, the legislation and the policy and the practices to sort of protect everyone's interest while we leap forward, it's great that we're leaping forward, but sort of there's a, a bit of a lag between where we are with the technology and where we are with the, sort of the infrastructure to make sure that it's all reasonably um, applied, I think. All right. Uh, one more question. I'll take the last one from Twitter. Okay. Um, just another easy one for you. Uh, Sam asks, do you think babies should have their DNA sequenced at birth? Well, that is a uh, really interesting question. Um, there are some projects, like there's one in, in the United States called BabySeq, that's been attempting to do that, but there has been actually a bit of resistance and pushback to that, that kind of a thing. 
I don't have an answer, but I would say that there are a few countries now that have dab dabbled in um, sequencing their entire population. So just over the weekend, Dubai announced that they are planning to sequence everyone in Dubai. They haven't specifically said, according to the article that I read, uh, whether or not that will be voluntary or not. Um, it is stated in principle that the reason that they want to do that is to, to make some predictions about disease instant incidents and carrying diseases. And, um, but that, that's a plan. And a few years ago, Kuwait had a law passed where it was going to be mandatory for everyone to undergo genetic testing. But then uh, there was a series of... of, of meetings about that and then that was that was repeal, re, 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 repealed but I, I guess I would say that um, perhaps there are different contexts and reasons why a society would want to do that and um, but I do think that there can be a, it's something that I think we need to talk about as a society because there are like so many benefits medically from 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 having that information at a very very young age but then we'll need to be sure to have the supports in so that that data is used the way that we as a society want it to be used I think fantastic well I think that has been some incredibly deep and complex things for us to think about that touch on many many different areas of our lives now and much more so into the future. So if you'd like to find out more, you can, of course, catch Caitlin on Twitter, Dr. Caitlin Curtis, or check out the Bris Science site for this talk, and um, we might try and post some links to your conversation articles and so forth. We'll, of course, be back next month. Watch for all the details, but please join me now in thanking Caitlin for a fantastic presentation. <laughs>